Welcome to the YouTube channel Bookworm. Today, we will listen to a brief retelling of the following book. The Great Gatsby by Frances Fitzgerald. If you measure a person by her ability to express herself, then there was something truly magnificent in Gatsby, some kind of heightened sensitivity to all the promises of life. It was a rare gift of hope, a romantic fuse that I have never seen in anyone else. Nick Carraway comes from a respectable wealthy family in a small town in the Midwest. In 1915, he graduated from Yale University, then fought in Europe, returning to his hometown after the war, could not find a place for himself, and in 1922 moved east to New York to study credit. He settled in the suburbs, on the outskirts of Long Island Sound, two completely identical caves protrude into the water, separated by a narrow bay, East Egg and West Egg, in West Egg, between two luxurious villas, and perched a little house, which he rented for $80 a month. In the more fashionable East Egg, his second cousin Daisy lives, she is married to Tom Buchanan. Tom is fabulously rich, he studied at Yale at the same time as Nick, and even then Nick was very unsympathetic to his aggressively flawed demeanor. Tom started cheating on his wife on their honeymoon, and now he doesn't feel the need to hide from Nick his relationship with Myrtle Wilson, the wife of a gas station owner and auto repairer, located halfway between West Egg and New York, where the highway runs almost close to the railroad and a quarter of a mile runs beside her. Daisy also knows about her husband's infidelities. It torments her. From his first visit to them, Nick had the impression that Daisy needed to run away from this house immediately. Music plays in Nick's neighbor's villa on summer evenings. On weekends, his Rolls Royce turns into a shuttle bus to New York, carrying huge numbers of guests, and a multi-seat Ford runs between the villa and the station. On Mondays, eight servants and a specially hired second gardener remove traces of destruction all day. Soon Nick receives an official invitation to Mr. Gatsby's party and turns out to be one of the very few invited. They did not expect an invitation there, they just came there. No one in the crowd of guests knows the host closely, not everyone knows him by sight. His mysterious romantic figure is of keen interest, and speculation is multiplying in the crowd. Some claim that Gatsby killed a man, others that he is a bootlegger, von Hindenburg's nephew and second cousin of the devil, and during the war he was a German spy. It is also said that he studied at Oxford. In the crowd of his guests, he is lonely, sober, and reserved. The society that enjoyed Gatsby's hospitality repaid him by not knowing anything about him. Nick meets Gatsby almost by accident. After talking with some man, they turned out to be fellow soldiers. He noticed that he was somewhat embarrassed by the position of a guest who was unfamiliar with the owner and received in response, so it's me, Gatsby. After several meetings, Gatsby asks Nick for a favor. Embarrassed, he beats around the bush for a long time as proof of his respectability. He presents a medal for Montenegro, which he was awarded in the war, and his Oxford photograph. Finally, quite childishly, he says that Jordan Baker will state his request. Nick met her at a visit to Gatsby and met at his sister Daisy's house. Jordan was her friend. The request was simple, to invite Daisy to replace for tea sometime, so that, supposedly by chance, in a neighborly way, Gatsby could see her Jordan said that in the fall of 1917 in Louisville, her and Daisy's hometown, Daisy and Gatsby, then a young lieutenant, loved each other, but were forced to part. He was sent to Europe, and she married Tom Buchanan a year and a half later. But before the wedding dinner, having thrown the groom's gift, a pearl necklace for $350,000, into the trash, Daisy got drunk like a shoemaker and clutching a letter in one hand and a bottle of sauterns in the other, begged her friend to refuse on her behalf groom. However, they put her in a cold bath, gave her a sniff of ammonia, put a necklace around her neck, and she married like a pretty one. The meeting took place, Daisy saw his house, for Gatsby this was very important. 
the festivities of the villa ceased, and Gatsby replaced all the servants with others who know how to keep silent, for Daisy began to visit him often. Gatsby also met Tom, who showed an active rejection of himself, his house, his guests, and became interested in the source of his income, which is probably doubtful. One day, after lunch at Tom and Daisy's, Nick, Jordan and Gatsby, and their hosts go to New York for fun. Everyone understands that Tom and Gatsby have entered into a decisive battle for Daisy. At the same time, Tom, Nick and Jordan are driving in Gatsby's cream Rolls Royce, and he and Daisy are in Tom's dark blue Ford. Halfway through, Tom stops by to refuel to Wilson. He announces that he intends to leave forever and take his wife away. He suspected something was wrong, but does not connect her betrayal with Tom. Tom goes berserk when he realizes that he can lose both his wife and his mistress at the same time. In New York, the explanation took place. Gatsby tells Tom that Daisy does not love him and never loved him, he was just poor and she was tired of waiting. In response to this, Tom exposes the source of his income, indeed illegal, bootlegging on a very large scale. Daisy is shocked, she tends to stay with Tom. Realizing that he won, on the way back Tom tells his wife to ride in a cream car with Gatsby. The others follow her in a stray navy blue Ford. When they arrive at the gas station, they see the crowd and the body of Myrtle, who has been hit. From the window, she saw Tom with Jordan, whom she mistook for Daisy, in a big cream-colored car, but her husband locked her and she could not come. As the car was returning, Myrtle, freeing herself from under the lock, rushed towards it. Everything happened very quickly, there were practically no witnesses, the car did not even slow down. Nick learned from Gatsby that Daisy was driving. Until morning, Gatsby stayed under her windows to be there if she suddenly needed. Nick looked out the window. Tom and Daisy were sitting together as one thing, spouses or, perhaps, accomplices, but he did not have the heart to take away the last hope from Gatsby. It wasn't until four in the morning that Nick heard a cab with Gatsby pull up. Nick didn't want to leave him alone, and since that morning Gatsby wanted to talk about Daisy and Daisy only. That's when Nick learned the strange story of his youth and his love. James Goats was his real name. He changed it at the age of 17 when he saw Dan Cody's yacht and warned Dan about the beginning of the storm. His parents were simple farmers, in his dreams he never recognized them as his parents. He invented Jay Gatsby for himself in full accordance with the tastes and concepts of a 17-year-old boy and remained true to this fiction to the very end. He recognized women early and, spoiled by them, learned to despise them. Confusion constantly reigned in his soul. He believed in the unreality of the real, in the fact that the world rests firmly and reliably on the wings of a fairy. When he stood up at the oars and looked up at the white hull of Cody's yacht, it seemed to him that everything beautiful and amazing that exists in the world was embodied in it. Dan Cody, a millionaire who made his fortune in the Nevada silver mines and operations with Montana oil, took him on a yacht, first as a steward, then he became a senior officer, captain, secretary. For five years they sailed around the continent, then Dan died. Of the $25,000 inheritance that Dan left him, he did not receive a cent, never understanding the legal intricacies due to which and he was left with what the peculiar experience of those five years gave him. The abstract schema of Jay Gatsby took on flesh and blood and became human. Daisy was the first society girl on his path. From the first time, she seemed to him dizzyingly desirable. He began to visit her at home, first in the company of other officers then alone. He had never seen such a beautiful house, but he knew well that he had not come to this house by right. The military uniform, which served him as an invisibility cloak, could fall off his shoulders at any moment, and under it he was just a young man without family and tribe, and without a penny in his pocket. And so he tried not to waste time. Probably he expected to take what he could and leave, but it turned out that he doomed himself to the eternal service of the shrine. 
She disappeared into her rich home, into her rich life filled to the brim, and he was left with nothing, except for the strange feeling that they are now husband and wife. With stunning clarity, Gatsby comprehended the secret of youth in captivity and under the protection of wealth. He had a successful military career. At the end of the war, he was already a major. He rushed home, but due to a misunderstanding ended up in Oxford. Anyone from the armies of the victorious countries could take a course for free at any university in Europe. Daisy's letters were full of nervousness and melancholy. She was young. She wanted to arrange her life now, today. She had to make a decision, and for it to come, some kind of force was required. Love, money, undeniable benefits, Tom appeared. Gatsby received the letter while still at Oxford. Saying goodbye to Gatsby that morning, Nick, already moving away, shouted, Insignificance on insignificance, that's who they are. You alone are worth them all put together. How glad he was later to have said those words. Not hoping for justice, the distraught Wilson came to Tom, learned from him who owns the car, and killed Gatsby and then himself. Three people were present at the funeral, Nick, Mr. Getz, Gatsby's father, and only one of the many guests, although Nick called all the Gatsby partygoers. When he called Daisy, he was told that she and Tom had left and left no address. They were careless creatures, Tom and Daisy. They broke things and people, and then ran away and hid for their money. They're all consuming carelessness or something else that their union rested on, leaving others to clean up after them.